Quick disclaimer. The Airway Circle Radio podcast has been produced for entertainment, educational, and informational purposes only. All of the content, views, and opinions shared by our hosts and guests should not be a substitute for medical advice. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Welcome to Airway Circle Radio, a podcast dedicated to conversations related to airway health, early intervention, sleep, breathing disorders, and practice management. Our series will showcase a few of my colleagues in what is sure to be insightful, thought-provoking, and engaging discussions. My name is Renata Nami, and I'm a registered dental hygienist, certified orofacial myologist, and the founder of Airway Circle, an online resource center for airway professionals. I'm excited to introduce this educational format that has something of interest for everyone. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to subscribe. Hello, everybody. My name is Nicole Goldfarb. I'm a speech pathologist and certified orofacial myologist. And we are here with Airway Answers, expanding your breadth of knowledge. And we have the wonderful Dr. Gerald Simmons here today. I'll do a little bio and then we want to talk about your amazing consortium that's coming up soon as well. If you don't know Dr. Simmons, you need to. You need to know him because he is amazing. Dr. Simmons is triple board certified in neurology, epilepsy, and sleep medicine, which I find to be an amazing combination for a lot of our patients where I'm referring them to Dr. Simmons because there may be other neurological issues combined with sleep concerns as well. So Dr. Simmons graduated from Ohio State University doing a neurology residency at Washington University and a sleep medicine fellowship at Stanford University and an epilepsy fellowship at the University of California. And Dr. Simmons was recruited in 1999 over to Houston, Texas, where he resides right now. And in 2006, he founded the Comprehensive Sleep Medicine Associates, providing clinical services to patients from infancy to the elderly age with a variety of sleep disorders. And education has always been important to Dr. Simmons. He's trained medical students, residents, and fellows in sleep medicine. And then in 2004, Dr. Simmons established the Sleep Education Consortium, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that holds continuing education conferences with a mission to enhance the knowledge of healthcare professions on sleep disorders. And this coming year, he's going to talk about the date and what that Sleep Education Consortium is like. But this is the 20th year. Is that right, Dr. Simmons? Yeah, actually, this is going into our 20th year of having the consortium. I was actually in academics, one part of the bio that there's a lot there, but I was on faculty at UCLA after I finished my training, and I really enjoyed teaching. When I decided to go on to private practice, into the private sector, I didn't want to let go of the teaching activities, and I saw the big deficit that exists in the healthcare system. Most healthcare professionals are not properly educated on sleep disorders, so the main mission of the Sleep Education Consortium is to try to fill that gap of knowledge that exists in most healthcare professionals and to teach about sleep disorders. So I started this in 2004 and also recognized the importance of dentistry within the field of sleep medicine because the upper airway being influenced by what goes on in the mouth. I've been collaborating with dental professionals for 30 years now. And 20 years ago is when I started the consortium to reach out to dentists and physicians and get them to be learning in the same environment, learning together, recognizing how we don't want to be in our silos and looking very narrow-mindedly at a particular problem, but we have to take a broader perspective. And we have to learn what each clinician has to offer in providing a more comprehensive package for a patient, so to speak. We've been doing the Sleep Education Consortium on an annual basis. Our next conference is coming up in April. It's going to be April 4th, 5th, and 6th for the dental professionals. It's going to be in Houston. On the 4th is only going to be for dental professionals and myofunctional therapists, high dentists. Um, and the afternoon section is going to be hands-on where everybody is going to be um, rotating to different stations, working with dental appliances, learning how to do the exam, the oral exam, learning how to take a registration bite, and just learning various aspects with hands-on activities 
And then um, fifth and sixth, it's going to be lectures with both dentists and physicians in the same lecture room, and there'll be many topics covered. We're going to talk about early intervention orthodontics. There'll be lectures on what happens during pregnancy and the impact of sleep apnea during pregnancy and on gestational changes in infants. And I'm talking about what can be done from a myofunctional standpoint throughout life, talking about orthodontics, who can open up the airway, both in kids and in adults, also surgical interventions, whether it be phrenectomy, soft tissue surgeries, or oral surgical maxillomandibular advancement surgeries. But there's also going to be lectures on narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome, insomnia, parasomnias. So there will be a deep dive in obstructive breathing, also central sleep apnea. But there's also going to be other sleep disorders. There'll be lectures on those as well. So from my perspective, when you have someone that's involved in the field, and they may only provide care to one aspect of it, they need to be sensitive to some of the other aspects of sleep medicine. Because once you start asking a patient about their sleep issues, it's like opening up a can of worms, and you're going to get all these responses. So if you want to increase your credibility with your patient, you don't want to seem naive when it comes to these other things that are going to be mentioned. The person that attends the conference, they're going to learn how to integrate what the patient's saying to a bigger picture, and they're going to not necessarily treat restless leg syndrome, but they're going to say, that sounds like restless leg syndrome, and you should be talking to your doctor, and you should be looking for certain things. You could be asking questions, for example, about iron deficiency, certain things that you may learn that may be associated with restless leg syndrome, or the patient may say, They're doing crazy things in their sleep. They're yelling and screaming and acting out their dreams. They may have REM behavior disorder, which could actually be made worse by antidepressants. There's things you can learn that can help you with your credibility with your patients. And it's a lot of material within three days. We've had people that have come repeatedly back to the conference because they want to learn more and they realize that there's just so much information that they didn't get it all the first time. So. Yeah, it's so helpful, this conference. I feel like it's one of the most comprehensive conferences out there because of everything you're talking about. There's that hands-on aspect where you're literally grouped with various colleagues and you're shifting around different stations and there's a doctor teaching you certain techniques like the chin press tongue curl maneuver or how to screen for tongue tie and how to do the bite registrations, all these things. You're learning about various areas hands-on with a variety of different professionals. Lots of MDs are there. All the lectures have such a range of information. And talking about non-airway related sleep disorders is such an important aspect as well, because the more you learn about that, your mind opens up and you start seeing that, wow, my patient might not just have sleep disorder breathing, but they might have narcolepsy. I've referred you a lot of patients that actually have narcolepsy, and you might be missing what you're treating if you're just narrowly focusing on airway. I think it's great. I've gone the last few years and it's an amazing conference. So it's April 4th through April 6th. And where is it located? It's in Houston. The webpage for more information is dentalsleepconference.com. Just straight up dentalsleepconference.com. And we right now we have the early registration, which will be until like the 30th of this month, which has a pretty steep discount for both the non-dentist and for the dentist as well. We're doing something new this year for dentists. If they register in conjunction with a physician, we're giving even a deeper dive because we really want to enhance collaboration. So I want to get dental medical colleagues to come together, and we're going to help teach them how they can work better together to manage patients. From the webpage, if there's any questions, reach out, and we can answer whatever questions. And we're looking forward to people being there in April. That sounds great. And if any questions come up, we will let you know. It's a wonderful conference. So I hope everybody registers. And even just 
following Dr. Simmons around asking him questions like what I tend to do (laughs) is really helpful because you know everything about sleep. If we're ready now, I want to get started with some questions for you about just a variety of sleep, basic sleep questions to know what's normal, what might not be normal when we're talking to colleagues and patients. So if you can just start out by reviewing the stages of sleep, what those are, kind of how long we're in each stage and what those stages do for the brain and body. Just real brief. There are different stages of sleep, as you pointed out. And the two big categories are REM and non-REM. REM stands for rapid eye movement. Non-REM is further broken down into three other stages, one, two, and three. So when you fall off to sleep, you'll start off in stage one, and then you'll evolve to stage two, and then stage three. And then after about 90 minutes of time, this is under normal circumstances, after about 90 minutes, a person will go into REM sleep. They'll have the rapid eye movements. And the brain is actively hallucinating and your eyes are moving almost like it's in relationship to what hallucinogenic phenomena is going on, but your body is paralyzed. You're not acting out your dreams. And that goes on for just a few minutes and then you come right out of it. And then you'll go through back into stage one or two. Then stage three again, and then 90 minutes later, you're going to REM again. But the next time you go into REM, it will be a little bit longer. And when you look at the amount of time the person spent in stage three, which we also call slow wave sleep, it's getting shorter. As the night evolves and you go through each of these cycles, we call it a sleep cycle, which is about 90 minutes. With each sleep cycle, slow wave sleep becomes shorter and shorter, and REM sleep becomes longer and longer. By the end of the night, A person really is not having any more slow wave sleep, and they're having these much longer periods of REM. So if you look at at a normal situation, people should be sleeping about seven and a half to eight hours of sleep. You look at what percentage are you in those different stages of sleep. Figure REM sleep should be about 20 to 25% of the night. Sometimes it'd be as low as 15. And slow wave sleep is pretty much about the same, 20, 25 sometimes as low as 15. When you start getting into much lower amounts of slow wave sleep, then that can have a significant impact on how your body is restoring itself. So your next question is, what was what are the significant features of each stage of sleep? Slow wave sleep is really when your growth hormone is created at its highest level, and it's more or less restoration of your body. So it's somatic restoration. And your pain threshold is influenced by your slow wave sleep. So if you don't get enough slow wave sleep, or if your slow wave sleep is very fragmented, then your pain threshold may become much lower. And pain signals that are coming into your body that may otherwise get filtered by your brain may not get filtered. They're going to reach all the way out to your cortex. You're going to feel pain in situations that maybe you otherwise wouldn't. When you're sleep deprived and you haven't had enough slow wave sleep, making some clinical relevance out of that. Patients that have fibromyalgia, typically they have abnormal slow wave sleep. And it's actually thought that maybe it's the slow wave sleep that leads to this condition. Because by not getting proper slow wave sleep night after night, year after year, pain threshold is very low. So these signals that should otherwise be filtered out by the brain aren't getting filtered and they're experienced as pain. Yes. So that's what I've heard. And I've heard you lecture that on that before that fibromyalgia is fibromyalgia, typically a sleep disorder. Can we conclude that? Let's, when you say a sleep disorder, it's a somatic disorder. Person's feeling pain, pain disorder is its origin from a sleep disturbance. And I would say there's a, in most cases, yes, I'm going to say it's in all cases, but in my mind, fibromyalgia is suggesting a sleep disorder until proven otherwise. It would be underlying sleep disorder that's leading to the fragmentation of slow wave sleep and leads to fibromyalgia symptoms. Okay. And this, the origin, that sleep disorder of lack or decreased slow wave sleep could be due to airway reasons or other reasons. It doesn't have to be right. airway. Okay. Right. That's interesting. And I feel like so many practitioners aren't aware of that. People might think fibromyalgia is just something wrong with the person. We don't know what's wrong. I feel like a lot of MDs and physical therapists should be aware of this potential sleep 
origin of this problem. That's interesting. What if somebody is aroused from a stage of sleep due to a breathing disorder and it's just maybe a short arousal like gasping for air or an apnea moment? Do they go back into the same stage of sleep they were in or does the cycle start over again? I wouldn't say that the cycle starts over again, but there's nothing that is reproducibly present in that scenario. Meaning, So let's say you're in stage two sleep and you have an apnea and you have a brief arousal, you may go back into stage one sleep and then transition to stage two sleep, or you may go right back into stage two sleep. It can happen either way. Question is, would you come right out of it and go into REM? If that were to happen, the reality is probably that you were already trending towards REM. And when you look at the muscle tone, you see it's starting to drop out and you look at the EG you might be starting to change more towards REM. Because it doesn't always happen just as a switch. It usually happens in sort of a transition, and then boom, it's clear-cut REM. Let's say the person's transitioning. That might be while they're having more obstructive breathing because of that muscle paralysis phenomena. So the upper airway is becoming more hypotonic. The person starts having an apnea, and boom, they get pulled out of it. They have an arousal, and then right after the arousal, they go back to sleep. And at that point, maybe they're going to go right into REM, which they were already headed to. But maybe classically by this sleep scoring criteria, it wasn't scored yet as rep. You can go any of the different directions. It's not predictable. Interesting. Okay. And then was there five stages of sleep and they eliminated one stage or combined? Yeah. So stage three was so slow wave sleep, we call it slow wave sleep or delta sleep, used to be stages three and four. And now it's just stage three. They've taken three and four consolidated it into just one stage which they call stage three or N3 for non-REM three. The differences between those, your sleep is tabulated in 30 second epochs. So during any one 30 second, there used to be that if there was anywhere from 20% of that 30 seconds had delta waves or slow waves, waves that are like two hertz or slower with 75 microvolts peak to peak. If the 20% to 50% of that epic consisted of slow waves. It was considered stage three. And if it was more than 50%, they called it stage four. But now they just consolidated the both of those and put it all at stage three. Hey there, podcast listeners. Before we dive into today's episode, we have an exciting announcement for you. This podcast is proudly brought to you by the members of Airy Circle, the premier community for healthcare professionals passionate about Airy Health. By joining the Airy Circle membership, you're not only helping us bring this podcast and our professional directory to the public at no charge, you will also gain exclusive access to a treasure trove of knowledge with hundreds of expert lectures. Whether you're a seasoned practitioner or just starting your journey, our diverse range of topics covers everything from breathing, craniofacial development, myofunctional therapy, palato expansion, to oral ties, sleep, and gut health. We would like to extend our gratitude to a few of our loyal listeners who share Airy Circle with their colleagues. To claim a free month of membership to Airy Circle, visit www.airycircle.com and use the code AIRWAYANSWERS. But don't delay because this offer is limited to five lucky individuals each month. And that's not all. As a member, you'll become part of a vibrant community of like-minded professionals, have the opportunity to learn from experts, participate in live Q&A sessions, and engage in discussions that will deepen your understanding of Airy Health. Don't miss out. Join the Airy Circle membership today and come grow with us. Airy Circle, where knowledge meets community. What about sleep debt? So is that recoverable? If you don't sleep enough over the weekend or maybe during the weekdays and then you try to sleep in extra on the weekends, how does that work? When you think of debt, you're thinking of something absolute, like this is how much debt I'm in. So if you look at someone that's not getting enough sleep, so they have sleep restriction, unless they, they go a whole year and rather than sleeping, let's say eight hours of sleep, they're only sleeping five hours. So they're getting three hours, anywhere from two and a half to three hours less every night. They do that for a year. Obviously, it's going to have its negative consequences. They're not going to have to make up hour for hour every hour that they lost. 
So when they first go, now let's say that time is over and then now they're ready to sleep. They can sleep as long as they want because they're no longer under the circumstances that prevented them from having enough sleep. The body will want to sleep more to catch up, but it's not going to catch up hour for hour that's lost. And is there an exact equation for how much sleep you have to regain? Not that I'm aware of, but the concept is that you do sleep more. Once you're given the opportunity, you might have a few nights of sleeping longer to get caught up, but it won't be hour for hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what happens if you're overly tired? Maybe you haven't slept well for a few nights or you stayed up too late and your body is really tired. What happens when you go to sleep? Because I know there's some negative impacts with breathing and airway. So could you explain that? So if you look at the muscle tone of the upper airway and your throat muscles, tongue, and you measure the muscle tone, when you're subjected to more negative pressure in your upper airway, the muscle tone increases. That's a normal reflex that your airway has governed by your brain. So there's a reflex circuit. The more negative pressure, the more muscle tone that exists. And that helps prevent your airway from collapsing. That reflex is blunted when you are sleep deprived. When you're very sleep deprived, there's more hypotonicity. There's more relaxation of your upper airway when you finally fall asleep. And that means your airway is more vulnerable to collapse. And you're not going to have that normal increased muscle tone reflex the way you normally would have had. So how do we know this? Well, there's been some studies done, but just you could do your own study. And that's by asking your patients about the snoring history. When you get a couple that's in your exam room and you're taking the history and you ask about the snoring, then if you're in a scenario where, let's say, the person's a shift worker and that sometimes they've been up extensive amounts of time and then they go to sleep, what you will hear is that, yeah, the snoring is really bad after they've worked that 36 hour shift or, you know, after they've been up an extended amount of time when they go to sleep, they snore worse. But then when they catch up on their sleep, their snoring isn't as bad. So we see that time and time and again as a clear example that the more sleep deprived you are, the more vulnerable your upper airway is to collapse because of that hypotonicity. Sleep hygiene plays a big role and insufficient total sleep time plays a significant role in people that have obstructive breathing. There are some individuals that once they've got normal amounts of sleep, their obstructive breathing is really minimal. And maybe they don't need very much intervention. But it's the sleep deprivation that's propagating into more obstructive breathing. That's so interesting when you think about it, that it's this kind of double-edged sword. If you have sleep apnea, you're sleep deprived because your sleep quality is bad. Then your muscle tone's worse because you're overly tired. And then you could help with some of these airway-related problems by working on the sleep hygiene. You kind of sometimes think the sleep hygiene is just helping with the environmental components, but it actually could be increasing muscle tone because the person is possibly less tired. That's a really interesting and important component. The more tired we are, the lower muscle tone we have in the upper airway, the more likely our upper airway is to collapse. And let's pick up, up, let's make that, that state dependent, meaning... Um, I can't tell you that when you're awake, if you're sleep deprived, that your upper airway muscles are more hypotonic. But when you go to sleep. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yes. When you sleep, everything just relaxes even more when you're more tired. Almost like your body's not as vigilant for like protecting itself. Maybe when it's so tired, that reflex is blunted. Okay. So sleep hygiene is important for all of our patients to make sure we're adding that component to their treatment plan. I want to talk about parasomnias because sometimes it's confusing to know what's normal, what happens at certain ages that's normal, what's the sign of a problem. So parasomnias such as sleep talking, sleepwalking, nightmares, night terrors, and even nighttime urination, so bedwetting, or even an adult having to get up to urinate. And I know we're going to have to break these kind of one at a time, but when is that normal? When is it not? Maybe if we could talk about sleep talking first. What age is that normal? Okay. So sleep talking, it's become so common that they've actually taken that out of being considered a parasomnia if that's the only thing that's occurring. I'm comfortable just disregarding it. 
Now, maybe you could say that in and of itself may not constitute a parasomnia, but it is a sign of disruption. And someone starts talking in their sleep. In some of the definitions, based on the most recent ones, are saying that, well, you can't say someone has a parasomnia if all they do is just mumble a little bit in their sleep. Because then it's like if they're going to talk, well, how much talking is significant? And it's splitting hairs. I think it's something worth noting. It's a sign that there's disruption. It's going to happen to everyone on some level, maybe once a year, could be once a night. But let's go beyond the talking. Let's add some additional behavior because if someone has something that's clearly significant, they may start doing more than just mumbling a few words. So let's say they're going to actually act out something. They're going to move around. Let's say they get out of bed. Let's talk about sleepwalking. Now, it's normal for a child to have a sleepwalking event. If they have one event, they don't need to go off to the doctor and, and say, what's wrong with my child? As a child is maturing, it's a common phenomenon that they're going to have a sleepwalking episode. If they have repetitive episodes, and it's going on more than six months now, clearly it was being recognized as being abnormal. And exactly, well, can I give you a number? It's like, well, what if it's three versus four? I mean, again, these are all just relative demarcations above which you clearly want to get help. If a child is doing this once a month for two or three months, and then it goes away, it goes away. Then if it comes back again about six months later and it's two or three months, then you yeah, would then seek out medical attention. Okay, because mm-hmm. it's longer than six months and it's not such an isolated phenomenon. But again, talking about frequency, so let's say it's going to be every week and it's been going on for the last four months now. I wouldn't necessarily wait six months. Mm-hmm. Say, oh, it's not six months yet because it's of a higher frequency that there's really something going on. No sense in waiting. Again, there's gray zones, but it's clear that multiple times for longer than six months, definitely want to get assessed. So what stage of sleep are, um, is sleepwalking occurring in? It's typically occurring in slow-wave sleep, non-REM sleep. Typically, the scenario is that something's caused an arousal, something that should wake up somebody, but the brain is trying in a very robust fashion, for very robust fashion, to stay asleep. And when you're in delta slow-wave sleep, it's harder to wake the person up than going to a full awake state because of all that slow-wave activity. Rather than waking up from some stimulus, they go into this quasi-state between wakefulness and sleep, and they carry out their dream. And they're going to start you know, moving around and get out of bed and maybe go walk into another room and then lay down and go back to sleep. Or they can start having night terrors, start yelling and screaming, and you're trying to console the child. You just can't. And then they lay down after a while and they go back to sleep. Usually this is occurring in slow-wave sleep. Okay. And night terrors are slow wave sleep. If someone's sleep talking, could that be any stage sleep? Yeah. Again, when you're in REM sleep, you're actively dreaming, but you don't carry out your dreams because of all the hallucinogenic, sorry, because of the muscle paralysis that we talked about earlier is occurring. Someone can be talking in REM sleep. In non-REM sleep, they could also utter things. One thing that might help you distinguish it would be that if there's more content in what's being said, mm-hmm. it's somewhat logical, more likely it's going to be in REM sleep. Um, mm-hmm. Versus non-REM, it may just be some gibberish that makes no sense whatsoever. Okay, It's not always the case, but that's one way of differentiating it. The other would be what time it occurs. Remember, I mentioned earlier that slow-wave sleep is more towards the beginning of the night and REM is more towards the end of the night. So if this phenomenon is occurring in the beginning part of the night, especially within the first hour of sleep, chances are it's non-REM. Where if it's primarily towards the end of the night, there's a higher chance that it's during REM. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where you might start thinking a REM behavior disorder because it's more frequent at that. Right. And so REM behavior disorder is something you're not going to see really in children. I mean, it can occur, but it's very rare. It's something you're typically going to see more in older individuals and it can occur even in conjunction with other kinds of neurologic conditions, such as Parkinson's disease. But it doesn't mean that everyone that has REM behavior disorder is going to have Parkinson's disease. But in many patients with Parkinson's disease, 
then you started having REM behavior disorder years before they had the rest of their underlying movement symptoms. But again, the REM behavior disorder typically occurs more you know, later on in life. Okay. And then the night terrors, is that usually a sign there's a problem? So there's some arousal pulling the child out of their sleep. And again, similar concept with the sleepwalking. If it occurs frequently over a six-month period, it's a concern? Well, yes. And when it occurs repetitively, then you have to think, oh, geez, what could be causing it? And a lot of times it could be from a traumatic event. Part of post-traumatic stress disorder can be night terrors. I guess what's important to distinguish is a nightmare from a night terror. Mm -hmm. Nightmare is a bad dream. And the person's not moving around, but they're actively dreaming and something is terrifying to them. They'll wake up, they'll remember it, but they weren't acting it out. If they were acting it out, that would be more of a REM behavior disorder, which can occur as part of a nightmare. A night terror is a non-REM sleep. And the person is going to have a high sympathetic output. They're going to wake up. Sorry, they're going to act like they're maybe awake. You're going to be yelling and screaming, but they're not really awake. If you measure their brainwave activity frequently, they're in slow wave sleep. Mm -hmm. And Uh, nightmare is in REM sleep usually because you're dreaming, but the night terror is in slow wave sleep. So that deep sleep where they're really hard to wake up, but something causes the body to wake up, but not so much the brain. Right. Okay. And not everything is so nicely packaged in that categorization. And there's overlap parasomnia conditions where is it really REM versus not REM? But in the classic sense, a night terror is going to be in non-REM sleep. But it could be a sign of having a traumatic event, whether it be abuse. You know, so if it's in a child, so we look for obstructive breathing as a cause. We look for period leg movements of sleep as a cause. If we can't find anything physiologic that's triggering these spells, at that point, we've done a job looking for physiologic causes. Now we have to look at psychological causes. You don't want to start off by thinking about psychological causes. That's right. sort of a dangerous pathway to go down. Because once you bring this up, the family starts to right away get real suspicious. And, and they're trying to think of, you know, who could be abusing my child? And you don't want to neglect bringing this up as a possibility. So once we've looked for the physiologic causes, can't find any, then it's important to have a real important discussion with the parent. There's a possibility of some kind of a traumatic event that has occurred, and maybe there's even abuse. So adults can have night terrors also? Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. When you're talking about potential causes, my younger son, when he was little, and I forgot what age, but he started getting a bunch of night terrors. And it's scary when that happens because they're like an alien or something. They're like, wake up and they don't know they're awake. You can't calm them. It's like you just have to almost be there to let it pass. And they don't remember it the next day. And later I found out his adenoids were so enlarged that, and he was a mouth breather, he wasn't breathing well at all. So after his adenoidectomy, that went away completely, the night terrors. They were recurring. And Nobody ever like mentioned, oh, he might not be breathing well. And that's why I just didn't know. And this was a long time ago. I didn't know what was wrong with him. But it was like, we'd walk him downstairs and he'd just be frantically screaming, like screaming and crying. And you could not console him. And it was like he had utter fear on his face. And then he'd just go back to sleep after a few minutes. And as a parent, it's pretty freaky to witness that. But it was clearly due to obstructed breathing. So it's important to note these could be signs of airway problems. Right. But no one, let me ask you, did you bring it to the attention of your pediatrician? I probably did. I don't remember, but I probably did. I don't know if I thought, oh, maybe it's normal. Some kids just have this as they're getting through stages. But clearly, if it's recurring, it's not normal and we need to investigate. It went away after the tonsillectomy, which clearly is a great demonstration of the relationship between obstructive breathing and and those abnormal behaviors during sleep. Yeah. And now it brings up for me, looking back on my childhood, I would get night terrors frequently and they couldn't wake me. But I remember once my brother was babysitting for me, my parents went out to dinner or whatever, and I had a night terror and he poured water on my head (laughs) to wake me up and I woke up. And I remember waking up in the middle of that, being like, what's going on? And I, it's like almost traumatic to remember because I remember it's very scary. Like you're in fear, 
And I had like sleep breathing issues as a kid. We didn't know about at the time, but, you know, also looking back on history for some of our adult patients, did they talk a lot in their sleep? Did they have night terrors? And I have a lot of patients who are adults that fill out my patient questionnaire as a new patient. And a lot of them check the box sleep talking. I'm always wondering as an adult, how normal is that? How common? What would you say for an adult for the sleep talking aspect? To me, it's a red flag. Okay. That there's something preventing sleep. And it's worth looking into. But frequently in most clinical scenarios where it requires some intervention, there'll be something just beyond just the talking. Yeah. So, and if I it's mean, a mild so, functional therapy patient referred from, there's probably an airway problem. So that's why we're getting a higher incidence of checking sleep talking box. And then also I have a nightmares questionnaire or do you get nightmares? And a lot of my adult patients get a lot of nightmares, frequent nightmares as well. So just to really point out how everything is sort of in a spectrum, it's not all black and white. So let's say you have a patient that has a real mild degree of obstructive breathing during sleep, not on a nightly basis, but on an occasional basis. They have no daytime sleepiness, no daytime symptoms. They function well at a high level during the day. If they sit and they can sit in a lecture, they can read for long periods of time. So there's no dysfunction of daytime performance. They don't have hypertension. They don't have sleep bruxism, but they have a little bit of obstructive breathing. They snore a little bit, but there's no other clinical manifestation. And let's say on occasion when they're having an obstructive breathing, maybe they're going to talk a little bit. Maybe these episodes when they're a little bit worse might even follow those evenings where they had a glass of wine, which is going to make this worse. So there's a little bit of talking, but there's nothing else going on. How aggressive should we be in treating that person versus you have a person that occasionally has sleep talking, has real mild obstructive breathing from the history and tells you, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But no one really spends the time to extract the history. But if you did, you'd find out that they really busy all day long because they don't want to sit still. They don't like sitting still. They don't want to sit in a lecture. They don't want to sit here and even have a long conversation with you if they have to listen because they get fidgety because they're walking around. They're very rested. They're having a lot of denial of their symptoms. But the spouse would tell you, oh, they're falling asleep at movies. They're just not concentrating. They can't pay attention. And at night, you know, there's maybe more tossing and turning. If face value, sometimes you these patients may look alike, but when you dig deeper, you can make the distinction. So I'm going to say the person that really you've dug deeper and you can't really find anything wrong, then it doesn't really require a real elaborate evaluation. Should they get a sleep study? It wouldn't be a bad idea to get a screening sleep study because maybe the apnea is worse than what was being recognized at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Did you do a home sleep test? You probably can do a home sleep test because if you're going to have bad sleep apnea, you'll pick it up. Mm -hmm. But on the other patient, you could do home sleep tests and it comes back negative. you got to bring them into the lab because they have symptoms. Mm -hmm. There's more clinical manifestation. There's more downside. Their level of obstructive breathing may be the same, but it has more clinical impact on one person than it does on the other because their brains may be different. One person may be more sensitive to feeling the ill effects of fragmented sleep yep. where the other person may be more resilient. Everyone just likes to follow these exact numbers and do things. You got to take the whole picture. Yeah. Consideration. And that's important. What you said for home sleep testing, it's home sleep apnea testing. And you always exemplify that because it's only picking up on apneas. And if a patient has clinical symptoms and their home sleep apnea test, comes back fine, they have to go to a sleep lab for an in-lab sleep study. And I don't think all doctors are aware of this. Well, I know all doctors aren't aware of this because I've had so many patients who are symptomatic, snoring so loud. The first thing that the MD does is a take-home sleep study. Maybe that's what insurance requires first. And it comes back fine or maybe mild. And then they don't do anything. It's like, wait, there's a problem, but I don't think a lot of people know the next step is you have to go in lab. Totally, 100%. The home sleep study becomes a dangerous tool when it's being utilized by people that don't understand what they're utilizing. Yeah. When they don't understand the limitations. It's not a screening test. You could say, I'm screening for severe sleep apnea, 
or more specifically, I'm screening for severe apnea that's associated with significant desaturation and oxygen. And if you've got someone that's asymptomatic and no other problems, no comorbidities, yeah, then you could use it to screen for that bad condition. That's the rare scenario. That's the exception. The rule is someone's claiming to have symptoms or you suspect that they have sleep apnea because of some other comorbidity, at that point, the home study is not a screener. You're using it to establish the diagnosis. It's like getting a CAT scan without contrast to try to rule out something going on within the brain. If it comes back negative, it doesn't mean you've ruled it out. You ruled out something really bad, but you haven't eliminated the possibility. Mm -hmm. In the scenario of the scan, you're going to then do an MRI, maybe with and without contrast. So they'll take a deeper dive before yeah. you can say for sure there's nothing. Yeah. Does everyone get that kind of scan? No. But when you're clinically suspicious of something, yes. Same thing with the sleep testing. You get some yeah. of those clinical symptoms. If you can diagnose this as simple as a home study, great. But if you don't make the diagnosis, they need to come into the lab. And then you have to make sure that the lab is using the most updated scoring criteria. Because mm -hmm. a lot of labs, even if they're accredited, they still only be using the criteria where there's a 4% desaturation to tabulate the hypopneas, that's a deficient sleep center. Right. Question about bedwetting. What age is that normal? And should that no longer occur? Again, it's a gradient. Everyone matures at a different age. But by the time the child is, let's say, four or five years old, and they're still having bedwetting, you got to be concerned. And clearly, obstructive breathing has been associated with nocturnal aneurysis. But other conditions, such as nocturnal seizures, can also result in bedwetting. But let's say bedwetting plus. So let's say you have bedwetting plus snoring in a child. Then there's a good chance that the bedwetting may be related to the snoring, because maybe it is due to obstructive breathing. Let's say bedwetting and a lot of tossing and turning. The sheets are all kicked up, so there's obviously a lot of activity at night or bedwetting with poor concentration during the day, or the irritable child. So bedwetting becomes at that point just one other red flag, one other sign that sleep is fragmented and something's going on abnormally during sleep. If a child has obstructive breathing and then we treat it, the bedwetting will improve or resolve. And giving an exact age, again, everyone matures a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. I'd say by four if the child's older than four or five years old, you don't want them to be, especially not on a regular basis. If they did it once, so they haven't bed wet in three, they stop having aneurysms in the bed. And then a year later, they have an episode. We wouldn't make a big deal out of it from one episode. But if it's recurring, then yes. And also getting up in the night to urinate is also a red flag. I think some people just think in a child bedwetting is a problem, but, oh, you know, my teenager wakes up throughout the night to go to use the bathroom. People might think that's fine because they're not wetting the bed, but technically we should not be waking up at all throughout the night to urinate at any age beyond when in childhood, when you are then sleep trained. Is that correct? Yeah. So there are some people that have just genetically, they have a smaller bladder and their holding capacity is smaller, but that's the exception, not the rule. And a urologist would do their evaluation and come to that determination clearly as a an adult male gets older and the prostate becomes enlarged, that could also result in frequent urination. What is known is that when you have obstructive breathing and you're working hard to breathe, you've got more negative pressure in the back of your airway, that negative pressure is also in your chest cavity. So your heart is subjected to that increased negative pressure. And that changes the way the blood flows through the heart. Because of that vacuum, there's more venous return going to the right side of the heart. So the right side of the heart gets distended a little bit. And as a result, it increases atrial nitratic peptide to be secreted, which causes your kidneys to want to dump fluid. So you can have more urine production at night from obstructive breathing, making you have the urge to get up to go to the bathroom. I typically try to get an understanding of someone's bladder capacity by asking how often do they have to go to urinate during the day? How long can they go between bathroom breaks during the day? And I would expect at night, it's going to be at least that long, if not longer. But if mm -hmm. they become short at night, so let's say during the day they can go six hours, but at night they can't go more than two. To me, it's telling me something's wrong if they have more urine production and they got to go to at night, then obstructive breathing is one of the possibilities. 
Yeah. And I've seen so many cases where you've treated with CPAP and the patient's like, oh, I don't get up in the night to urinate anymore. Or even a lot of my myofunctional therapy patients don't urinate in the night anymore when they did, or at least it's cut in half. I have a patient who would get up four to five times a night and throughout the course of myofunctional therapy, it's now maybe once or twice, which still is probably not normal, but you can see that that's helped with his breathing and sleep quality. It's just interesting how that's another red flag to be aware of. I want to talk a little bit about bruxism. When that occurs during sleep, would you say that nearly all nighttime sleep or bruxism is related to an airway problem? I would say the majority of cases. Okay. And a lot of people would debate me and say, I'm wrong. And how do I know? If someone's bruxing just in their sleep, it's not from stress. The stress is during the day. Although it could be from the stress of obstructive breathing. If someone's waking up in the morning and that's when they have TMJ dysfunction and tightness, for the rest of the day, they're fine. You got to wonder what's going on in sleep that's causing this to happen. And what we now have come to recognize is that when you're locking your jaw in, keeping your mandible forward, you're actually helping to protect your airway. So when everything relaxes and your jaw falls back, the base of your tongue goes back and your airway starts to obstruct. Sleep bruxum actually becomes a protective mechanism in the airway. And we've seen this on enough patients that once we've treated them with something like CPAP, the TMJ symptoms are improving. They're not waking up with the tightness. They're not clenching throughout the night. Now, if their pressure on their machine is turned up too high, that's a different story. And they might be bruxing to try to keep their mouth closed. But if you have the right pressure on the machine, in most cases, it allows the upper airway to relax without the obstruction. Clearly, sleep bruxism is related to obstructive breathing in most patients that have sleep bruxism. And they're cracking their teeth and they're going to the dentist. And everyone else is missing the fact that there's obstructive breathing. But then when you get a dentist that's been educated, come to one of these conferences, they know maybe they themselves aren't real involved in sleep dentistry, but they now know that when the patient's sitting there cracking their teeth at night, or they see signs of fractions and other bori, other signs of sleep exercise, they're going to point that patient in the right direction to get the kind of care that they need. I just moved. So I went to a new dentist yesterday Of course, my appointment is like two hours because we start talking about airway because I heard him telling a patient in the room next to me that he needs a night guard or start talking about airway. And a lot of dentists aren't aware that a night guard in at least 50% of the cases can actually make the sleep breathing issue worse. We're kind of putting a Band-Aid on the symptoms and increasing that vertical dimension causes the lower jaw to fall back even more. I heard you lecture recently talking about as negative pressure increases in the airway, there's, I think it's a reflex, but you can clarify this, where the genioglossus and the masseter increase in muscle tone, which is normal with an increased negative pressure to breathe. As that negative pressure increases more, that's when that bruxism can occur because the masseter and the genioglossus increase in tone, jaw thrust forward, tongue thrust forward for the breathing, right? For airway protection. A tongue thrust during sleep, if a patient does great with their myofunctional therapy exercises, good tongue posture during the day, but they wake up, they're like, oh, my tongue is always forward, thrusting forward. That is a sign that they're potentially protecting their airway when they're sleeping. And what is that reflex called where the negative pressure? the The negative pressure reflex circuit. It hasn't worked out. We know that the hypoglossal motor nucleus, which is in the medulla, the bottom of the brainstem, it controls not just the genoglossus, it actually controls a lot of the upper airway muscle tone. Mm -hmm. And so you've got the respiratory centers that are pacing your brain to breathe that are also going to cause increase in the muscle tone synchronized to the breath. So when you breathe, there's increased muscle tone to keep it open. Then there's also this negative pressure reflex circuit. So, I mean, there was a good study, which I lecture about it's without the graphics, it's harder to identify, but they take patients that had a tracheostomy, get the trach unplugged, so that way they're breathing through their trach and the air is not going through the upper airway. And they measured the increased muscle tone associated with breathing, and it was minimal. Then they plugged the trach, so now the air had to go rush through the upper airway. And as the air is rushing through the upper airway, it's causing an 
increase amount of negative pressure, sorry, increase amount of muscle activity with each breath. Your upper airway is recognizing that there's flow and there's negative pressure and it's responding to it. That's a great study. That's really interesting. What about like if someone used to have bruxism and they don't anymore, do you find that the apnea gets worse because they're no longer protecting their airway? Or on the contrary, patients who brux are going to have less severe sleep apnea because they're protecting their airway. Right. So a lot of times you'll see that because they're bruxing, they minimize the amount of obstructive breathing. And some patients will actually put a nasoesophageal pressure catheter to measure these more subtle degrees of obstructive breathing called respiratory effort-related arousals. And we also add extra electrodes to measure the muscles of mastication so we can characterize the bruxing better. We'll try to establish the diagnosis where other labs may have failed. Patients say, are told they have no problem, but yet they have all these symptoms. And then we'll step it up, do the study more meticulously. We find the breathing problem. But the other phenomenon is also true where if someone's bruxing and then as they gain weight, they get older and the bruxing no longer protects their airway so much or they're becoming so so sleep deprived that there's more hypotonicity, then the bruxing may stop and then the obstructive breathing is going to get worse. And when you take histories, we frequently have found this flip where someone said, oh, I used to have bruxism. I used to wake up with jaw pain, and but I don't do it anymore. Okay, when did it stop? Oh, maybe five years ago. And then later in the history, it's like, all right, when did you start having these observed pauses in your breathing? It's like, oh, about five years ago. It's almost like there's actually, once you stop that compensatory phenomena, it may lead to a worse degree of obstructive breathing. Like the body's giving up? Basically. That's really sad. Okay. Does bruxism ever occur only during the day? Or do you feel like if someone is, um, let's just think, grinding their teeth or clenching during the day, it's probably occurring at night and they might not be aware? Or do you ever find it might just be it during the day? Yeah. If it's during the day, then it's not a sleep problem. Right. I find because a lot of patients don't know they grind their teeth at night and it's the dentist who's noticed right. from so- them. Let's talk about the 24-7 bruxer. The person that brux at night and day. Does that mean there's a sleep problem if they're also bruxing during the day? Maybe it's a sign if they got a male occlusion that's real clear cut, maybe it has nothing to do with their sleep specifically, and it's because they got a male occlusion and they brux 24-7. But what I like to do is go back in history and I say, okay, now you're bruxing 24-7. But what about years ago? When you started bruxing, was it 24-7 right from the onset? or Initially, was it primarily at night, and then it evolved to become 24-7? Or maybe it started during the day, and then it became 24-7. Frequently, you're going to find that it started off as a nighttime phenomena. And once it got so bad that they started having TMJ symptoms, and then it started to involve the daytime. And it's now evolved to 24-7. But when you peel it back to its origins, a lot of times it started off just at night. As the TMJ becomes more dysfunctional, then you can get daytime bruxing as well. Mm -hmm. Are there any medications that cause bruxism? Because I've heard like antidepressants could trigger that. Well, you can get increased muscle tone with certain medications and antidepressants are one of them. But again, if it's changing how you're sleeping, then if anything, if someone tells me that the bruxism gets worse when they take an antidepressant or their TMJ symptoms are worse, it would point more towards a sleep-related breathing problem. Because they probably have the depression from the poor quality of sleep. Not probably, but it's possible that led to their depression. Well, one thing you need to know is that antidepressants, almost all of them, are anti-REM. They're going to increase muscle tone during REM. And they can actually increase the likelihood of having REM behavior disorder. If someone's going to have more apnea during REM and they're taking antidepressants, they may be bruxing more. Mm -hmm because they're not having the same degree of hypotonicity, maybe they're bruxing more as a result of that, and maybe they're going to have more symptoms. Wait, so antidepressants increase muscle tone. I never knew this. Yeah, they block the hypotonicity of REM. Of REM. Okay. But it wouldn't help with breathing, because it's not increasing upper airway muscle tone. Okay, I'm like, hmm. (laughs) Years ago, people were treating mild apnea with antidepressants. I mean, it's not the Ah. way it's not the way we go about treating it. Huh. But, That's you know, interesting. 
You can. So that could actually help the depression, maybe because they're sleeping better or no? I wouldn't go down that pathway. There's better ways to treat. Right. Okay. What about low iron or ferritin? Could that have any relationship? I know that has related to restless leg syndrome, but what about to bruxism? I'm not aware of anything that relates specifically to bruxism from iron levels. Okay. The only thing I could think of is that if your brain is conditioned to brux whenever it has an arousal, if because of the breathing, and if you also have leg movements, the arousals from the leg movements may trigger bruxism. And if you're having more periodic leg movements to sleep because of low iron, maybe you're going to more. It's an indirect. It's not direct. right. And this is why in lab sleep studies are so important because they're going to be picking up. Hopefully, if it's a good physician, they're going to be picking up on leg movements, jaw, you know, muscle movements, things like that. And you can't get this from a take home sleep study. What about to REM? Do some people ever get no REM or like too much REM in their sleep? Does that ever occur? No one has no REM. Okay. On any particular night, they may not, especially the night they come into a sleep lab and they're hooked up to all these probes. It may disturb their sleep and they may not go into REM. Okay, wait, so it's possible on a sleep study because you're so disrupted, you might not get any REM sleep. Right. Because I've had people who say, oh, I get no REM. I'm like, their sleep study shows no REM and they're all worried. But it just was that particular night because they were uncomfortable. Yeah, they may have a decreased amount of REM, but to have no REM, I don't think anyone has no REM. But it may be severely decreased. And it could even be because of certain medications. And then when you stop the medication, there could be a REM rebound. There could be, a, like I said, a decreased amount of REM, but not no REM. In terms of increased REM, only if you're trying to make up for a decrease in REM. So if you're REM deprived, let's say from sleep apnea, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, because if your REM is associated with such bad apnea that it up pulling you out of REM, then you go on to CPAP, you may have what we call a REM rebound. We have okay. long periods of REM, but on a normal basis, people aren't going to have increased REM. There'll be an increased tendency to go to REM. And that's what narcolepsy is. But when you measure how much total REM they get within 24 hours, it's pretty much within the normal range. It just is very fragmented and there's an increased REM pressure that occurs throughout the day. Okay. A couple more questions. I have a question about central apnea because I just heard a lecture that central apnea always co-occurs with sleep apnea. And I'm confused because I heard it's also normal for people to have central apnea as they're falling asleep or after an arousal. And I also heard it's never normal. So could you just explain that? Yeah. What you're describing, are, it's not correct information. It's uh, You can have obstructive breathing in association with central apneas. Central apneas, if they're only going to occur a couple times a night, it's not a big deal. But they can occur totally independent of obstructive breathing, completely. Central apnea is when your brain is not giving the signal to your lung muscles to breathe. And your respiratory drive, it's governed and controlled by your CO2 levels. When you fall asleep, your brain allows you to have a higher CO2 level than when you're awake. So when you first fall off to sleep, there's less respiratory drive because your CO2 level hasn't risen up yet. So for the first few seconds, you're not going to be breathing as much and your CO2 starts to rise. And then once it's risen, you have an increased respiratory drive again. Mm -hmm. If someone has an exaggeration of that responsiveness to CO2, they can have what's called a high loop gain. So as they fall asleep, their CO2 level is much lower than what the brain wants it to be, and it rises up. And it could be because the person's hyperventilating a lot during the day, and their set point is much lower, and they're Mm -hmm. inclined to a much lower CO2. So when they fall asleep, there's a bigger difference, bigger delta between their wake and their sleep CO2 levels. So there's going to be the central pause. If that's the only problem, it's not a problem. It occurs. But what happens when the central event, and once breathing starts up again, there's obstruction. And the person's breathing against the obstruction, and the obstruction causes another awakening or another arousal. Mm-hmm. That arousal can be very short. The person's going to take a few deep breaths. CO2 set point changes, and they go right back to sleep. And again, their CO2 set point is going from this lower level to this higher level, and there's going to be a central pause. So a lot of times people have these mixed apneas, mm-hmm. the arousals from the obstruction, 
and the post arousal central is sort of a normal high loop gain phenomena. Yeah. And then you see these occur repetitively. Treat the obstruction, it all goes away. I mean, they might have one event right where they go to sleep, but then they're you're now having got CPAP and they're going to not have obstruction. So they don't have another arousal. So they don't have a post arousal centrals. In a child, is that the same thing? Like they might have post arousal central apneas and that's normal? Well, with having the apnea is not, but having the obstructive apnea. Oh, yeah. So if all they have is post arousal centrals as you're falling asleep and there's nothing else wrong, then there's nothing else wrong. Or in the middle of the night, let's say they maybe had an obstructive event or something triggering an arousal, and then there's a central in the middle of the night. That's normal for a child to maybe have a few centrals. Okay. Unless um, they drop their oxygen. Now, that, hold your breath right now for a second. Hold your breath for 10 seconds. Do you think your saturation level is dropping? 10 seconds of decreased breathing in and of itself shouldn't drop your oxygen unless you're not. Your ventilation perfusion ratios are off and you're just holding your breath for 10 seconds should cause your oxygen to drop. Oxygen is not very sensitive to measure obstructive breathing. If it does drop, that's a greater sign that there's a significant problem. And that's Mm -hmm. central apnea as well. So if a child has central apnea and they're dropping their oxygen every time they're doing it, by let's say four percentage points, five percentage points, well, that's significant. If it happened once or twice a night, it's not. If it happened five or six times an hour, it's definitely significant. Yes. And when you see someone sighing in their sleep, child or adult, making a sigh sound, what would you say that might be? Nothing. Okay. If it happens repetitively, it's a sign of disrupted sleep. Okay. Some people say it's like a, what, a rescue breath or blowing off excess carbon dioxide. Can be. Can be. Okay. I know we are just about a little bit over an hour. Well, one, I want to thank you so much. Like asking the expert, you are amazing. Like there's so much to learn. And I feel like these are all really important things for us to just know and understand and have a taste of for the types of patients we see. If we could do a part two, these are the areas I would ask about is sleep position, talking about that because we have patients who have mild sleep apnea and they call it positional apnea. And I wonder, do we treat those? Do you just say adjust your position? So that's going to be something to talk about. Reflux and sleep disorder breathing is something I want to ask you about. Periodic limb movement and restless leg syndrome. And melatonin, is that safe to give a child? What about adults? And pregnancy and sleep disorder breathing. And then PTSD and sleep disorder breathing. And let me just look at what my other questions. Yeah. And do all patients with sleep disorder breathing need a sleep study or should we just start treatment? What age? So I have, these are my other areas of questions for part two. So everyone can get excited because I feel like it's good information. And let's see what else. Narcolepsy. I did want to ask a little bit about that and co-occurrence, but I know we don't have time for that today. Nada, you're back. I'm here listening to this incredible lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Simmons, for this podcast recording. I mean, you guys, Nicole, you always have the best questions. And Dr. Simmons always has the best answers. (laughs) So thank you for doing this. It's incredible. Yeah, thank you. You know, all the stuff, things that we cover in the conference, FYI. Plus, Yes. I just posted a link to the conference on Airy Circle under our video. So I hope to see everybody there. I'm coming this year. That'd be great. Great. Yes. You go through detail with the visuals at the conference. And it's just so important, again, with the population we're working with, once you open up that airway can of worms, all these other things are going to come up because it's less often that it's just airway and not other components, right? There's other things going on with a lot of our patients. Um, It's important we're aware of all of this other information. So thank you so much for educating us. It's probably exhausting for you to go through all this, all my questions. So I really appreciate your time. Yeah, I sort of lost my voice. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm getting over a cold. so. So get some tea and honey, get some good sleep. Thank you so much. I hope you get better fast. All right, Great. And again, remember the dentalsleepconference.com. And for physicians, it's medicalsleepconference.com, which is the two day conference, three days. Okay. Amazing. Dental professional. Wow. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to our radio style broadcast, where we bring different perspectives to the airway world in an easily digestible format. 
Different hosts, different views, same airway talk. Don't forget to leave us a review. Bye-bye.